Okay, so it's eight? Yes. All right, we are live. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Paint Jam. Uh, we've got Mr. Leo Gonzalez uh, here tonight to, to lead this. And Leo is not only a really solid tattooer uh, from the Albuquerque, New Mexico area, but he also uh, is a very accomplished fantasy painter. Uh, his stuff is really, you know, very dialed in, very highly developed. And uh, he especially likes to paint fantasy creatures. He's done a lot of dragons. And right now he's working on this manticore. Uh, Leo, why don't you go ahead and show us your manticore and tell us a little bit about what this mythical creature is and, uh, you know, uh, what it's a combination of and uh, all that stuff. I'd love to hear a little bit about it. Cool. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me and uh, glad to be here. So, yeah, the manticore. Um, it's basically, I, initially, I thought it was Greek mythology is what it stemmed from, but uh, did a little bit of research once I had the idea that I wanted to do a manticore and realized that it's actually Persian mythology. Um, it's generally a lion's body with either a scorpion tail or sometimes they have just like a spiked club tail and a monstrous human-like face. Um, and they're, most of the time you see them, they're depicted with wings. But again, that was one of the, the cool things that I discovered when I did some research is that uh, the original Persian le legend, they were wingless. And uh, so I decided after, after messing around for a while, I, I thought that compositionally it was gonna look better without wings. So I went with the original legend kind of version. And, uh, and then I also decided instead of like a strictly human head, I wanted to give it kind of like an ape face, which, uh, you know, is kind of homo sapien, but not quite. So- oh, Definitely uh, a lot more ferocious looking. Yeah, yeah, I thought it would be more ferocious looking. One of the cool features about manticores that I've always been kind of uh, obsessed with is that they have uh, triple rows of teeth. And so uh, I, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but I gave my guy three three jaws in, within his mouth. Um, but uh, yeah, I can, br I can actually bring up a closer uh, sh screen share of it. Hold on one sec. So yeah, while you're getting that set up, I wanted to welcome everyone else who's tuned in tonight to, to Art Jam with us. And uh, once we get settled in, we're going to uh, uh, share out the Zoom link. But yeah, okay, some reference here. So we got the... Uh... So this is where the painting is right now. And, uh, you know, I can... Let me see if I can zoom in. Are you guys seeing that? Yeah. Okay. I don't know why I'm not getting a zoom on this. There we go. Yeah. Okay. There you can see kind of the. All right, did you want to see this up close? Yeah. The triple rows of teeth there on the upper jaw, which I thought was a cool little uh, feature about the mythology of them. I thought it was funny too that uh, the the research that I did it talked about how they give like a cooing, mewling kind of sound where you'd think it would be like this roar, right? And I thought that was extra creepy. <laughs> right. Oh yeah, because it's not just this cliche monster. Rah. Yeah. For sure. Nice. So, uh, how many hours so far? Well, you know what, I've, I, I try not to keep track of that. <laughs> yeah, nothing to gain from doing that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, as, as you may know, uh, my family and I have been doing this uh, Strata Easel Challenge. Yeah, um, cool, man. And uh, yeah, the idea is that you're painting something from life. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it be a landscape or you know still life or whatever, and I've just been painting objects. 
and I wanted to find a nice object that was uh, something in the fantasy creature uh, vocabulary. So flip this around. Let's see. Yeah, there we, there we go. Yeah, this this was a uh, a gift from a client many years ago, and it sat outside. It was supposed to be an indoor outdoor sort of thing. Mm -hmm. this, uh, this Griffin thing, and uh, and it got kind of rotted and corroded, which sort of improved it in a way. Sure. So, yeah, I'm uh, I'm going to be doing this one to two aspect ratio here, kind of a fun crop. And I'm just going to crop, a, you know, part of the face and one of the hands, some of the eggs uh, that it's that it's sitting on. Um, and, you know, with these still lifes, I've been sort of doing the opposite of what you did with your manticore with, you know, more or less zero preparation. Just uh, start stabbing away with the brush and trying to uh, get the approximate... Uh, proportions blocked in and then develop it from there which is kind of fun you know it's it's also the opposite of the tattoo process you know i've been wanting to do that as more uh plain air painting or just you know trying to paint something start to finish without um you know without all the hubbub of preparing like a you know what how i normally approach something right yeah basically uh a la prima yeah so sit down and paint and finish yeah it's 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 fun you know it's it's a completely different way of painting there's a little bit more pressure because Good. for example it, let's say you want to get a particular lighting effect you want to have elements that get lower contrast as they get farther back as you have with your painting uh -huh. uh, you know, you have to nail all your values right there in that first pass. You know, you can't just add glazes until it's perfect. Yeah. So you have to really have a much clearer idea of your vision and be able to uh, get it knocked out in, in fewer, way fewer brush strokes than you would if you were afforded the liberty of letting it dry and keep layering it. But that lends uh, a great energy to it too, you know. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's why I love it. I, I think it's worth, you know, pursuing as a painter, even though the results are definitely way less controlled. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that that's one of the issues that I have being a tattooer. I mean, I love tattooing, but the level of control that's required is, uh, you know, well, it's well known. It's definitely... Uh, you don't want to sit down with an artist that doesn't have a high level of control, right? Sure. Uh, and finding the right way to let go and loosen up in a tattoo, you know, you almost have to design a tattoo around it. Like, okay, this background stuff here, I'll let myself get a little loose with that. Or, you know, with this texture, I'll let that stuff get a little loose. But then you have to make sure that there's enough important features, enough uh, edges that are nice and firm and crisp and nicely developed uh, in order to keep it looking intentional. You know, that's one of the things with looseness in a painting, you kind of expect it, you know, in a tattoo, it just looks sloppy or unfinished. You know, uh, some of my favorite fantasy artists and some of my favorite works by them uh, turns out was stuff that they did in a single night, which, you know, absolutely blows my mind. I found out uh, uh, one of my favorite Frank Rosetta paintings, it's uh, the, the Destroyer. It's got uh, Conan fighting this big group of warriors, right? And he's coming up above Oh, him. yeah, yeah. That's a, that piece is legendary. I know exactly the piece. That's uh, one his, night. His wife told him the night before, hey, you know that you realize that that's due tomorrow. And he hadn't, he hadn't even started it. <laughs> he went out to the yard and cut down a piece of board, put on the coffee, kissed the kids goodnight. And when they woke up that morning, he was dragging himself off to bed and the painting was there on the easel finished. It's insane. Yeah, that is. That's, uh, wow. 
Well, you, you know, you not only need to have a really good idea of your picture, but you also have a have a real mastery of the paint to be able to uh, you know, do it with, without going over it multiple times, which, you know, my best paintings obviously have lots of layers on them. Just, I mean, same with you, you know, it's uh, a way that we're comfortable with. And I do that as a tattoo artist also. And it's, it's funny because I'll begin working and uh, every painting, I feel like it gets away from me. I pull it back in, it gets away from me again. And it's this constant uh, push and try to, to dial it in until, until you reach that destination. It's I've lost my paintbrush that I was going to start this piece with. Uh -oh. I had a complicated 15 minutes uh, leading up to this. Okay, well, I'll just have to pick a different one. I was in a bit of a scramble myself. Hmm. Yeah, I've, I've been working with this fairly large brush, like a half inch filbert, because it uh, prevents me from getting lost in the rabbit hole of development. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, since each of these is really supposed to be finished pretty quickly, I'm trying not to uh, to go there, so sure. you know the big brush just prevents that. And I, I also just like the again that looseness. Now I imagine with the uh, you know that uh, Frazetta piece that you're you're talking about, the Destroyer. Um, you know, in order to be able to knock it out that fast, you know, a lot of it is really loose, but. Uh, and you know, I imagine he probably did a lot of it with mostly bigger brushes. Just went in there with a smaller brush, just where necessary. Uh, but I mean, that's why his. It, I don't know if it's possible for us to pull that piece up right now. Um, no, you know what? This this kind of thing. You you start talking about pieces that you know about. Uh, you know it. it it's impossible to, to know ahead of time what pieces to, to pull off the internet and have ready. I don't think Gabe is with us tonight and Sandy is painting. <laughs> I'm here. I haven't started painting yet. Uh, so if you want me to yet. pull up anything uh, right now, I can totally help with that. Yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah, what was the, what was the painting? Okay. Was it, it is a, a Frank Frazetta piece called The Destroyer. figure out the right setup here where okay and i also set up a, a photo album so i could uh if people are interested so kind of my my thought process on this on this manicore piece and kind of the steps i took oh nice so you've been documenting yeah and i and i don't usually do that but i did that to a degree to a degree So what are the steps that you have planned for uh, tonight's session? I'm going to work on the tail and the, the the scorpion part of it, basically. OK. Um, and this is the kind of painting where you're you're going to be focusing on a small area for most of any given session. Sure. Yeah. I mean, while I'm doing backgrounds and stuff, I can kind of, you know, go all over the place. But once I start getting into specific, uh, once I'm past the background, it kind of yeah, there we go. Okay. okay, crazy. So that's one night's work. Yeah. Mm. Incredible. So do you think you had a sketch at least beforehand or? You know, maybe I, he did do sketches and prelims. Uh, you know what, too, this... He, he painted it, sent it off, and then when he got the painting back, he wasn't happy with the Conan figure. So he actually went in and repainted Conan. So uh, the, there's two versions. He did that a lot, uh, where he would paint one version, send it off to the publisher, get the painting back, and decide, nah, 
and and reaps <laughs> watches of it. There's actually a set of paintings that I love of his that it turns out they no longer exist because he got them back, decided he didn't like the painting, and painted something, another painting completely over it. And that, that uh -huh. painting was totally wow. lost. And it was like incredible, right? <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh, definitely a, a level of commitment to like not liking a piece. Wow. You know? <laughs> You figure you could just put it away. Eh, I'm not going to hang this one up. Yeah. Uh, this, this isn't even worth the panel that it's on. Yeah, pretty wild. So we've got a couple people in the comments here. Uh, we've got Connor Foley is in there. We've got Ginger and Tavon. And and Javon on. says that the, uh, the manticore is making him think of the that cartoon, The Last Unicorn. Oh, with the Red Bull? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's an old favorite. Yeah, definitely. That's class. Good one. So, Leo, you want to share out the Zoom link now? Are we there? Sure. Yeah. How do I do this? Uh, Sandy will do that. Okay. Yeah, that's... Totally cool. Yeah, and, and you know, this is kind of like those tattoos of sculpt, uh, sculptures that you see. You know, I'm doing a piece of art about a piece of art. Sure. In a way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But, uh, you know, I like the the shape of it and the way the light plays off of it. I'm doing a creative crop. And uh, plus I'm just painting, I'm practicing my painting skills. That's what this whole strategy easel challenge thing is. And So you said uh, the whole family's doing it. Yeah, yeah, we've all been doing it. Uh, and yeah, Kaya has done a lot of still lifes. Uh, she, she's done like three paintings a day since we got started on oh. this. It's pretty awesome. And you said it's 30, is it 31 days? 31 days, yeah. The 31 wow. days challenge. And uh, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> a push. It's more of a push than I had realized. It's not getting any breaks. And, uh, you know, you got stuff going on, right? You got a tattoo here or there or whatever. Uh, you're tired because you've been working on home improvement projects all day and it's like yeah i guess we're gonna paint anyway but i'm not complaining it's kind of like after the encyclopedia kickstarter i ended up you know committed to doing 74 paintings and uh mm -hmm. and it was fun you know uh i, I didn't have to you know, I, I could take days off, you know what I mean? It was it was a different situation. Uh, I could still fit it around my life. Where with this, you have to fit your life around it. You know, it's kind of a boot camp sort of thing. But that's, uh, you know, that's why we do things like this, right? So, you know, before I get painting here, I'm going to screen share real quick. Again, like I said, with uh, some of the uh, the process that went into this. Yeah, yeah, let's check it out. So, you know, like I said, I started with research, and uh, I I like doing the research because it can open up avenues that you didn't you know think about before, such as. The, you know, finding out that this was a Persian legend, not Greek, and finding out with, that they originally didn't have wings, and this would have been an entirely different painting, right? Um, here's some of the uh, the reference that I compiled. Um, I knew I wanted to do some some cool landscape elements, so uh, I got various even photographs that I took out and about just to uh, 
you know, not, nothing that I took directly from, but just stuff to like inform my decisions while drawing and, and the elements that I wanted to kind of incorporate. Um, All right, just so that, for example, the shelf fungi, you know, you had some real shelf fungi that you were at least, you know, learning from as you were drawing them so that yeah, yeah. They, they didn't turn out cartoony or whatever, yeah. And uh, that's something I learned the hard way over and over again, really. That, yeah. uh, I know what it looks like, but I really don't, <laughs> you know. Yeah, so exactly, exactly. It's always good to pull from, from stuff like that. Um, you know, seeing musculature and the anatomy of the animals. I've always felt well, while doing fantasy art that uh, it's most successful if you can make something that doesn't exist be believable and seem to exist, right? So um, what's great about creatures like this, I can pull reference from actual living animals that we're familiar with and you know i mean i still manipulate the anatomy somewhat you know to suit my purpose but i feel like that's just the strong base to start from there's a gorilla head that i really like that i kind of used to construct my own uh i had never painted waterfalls so that was that was probably the biggest challenge for me in this and didn't i didn't do it quite like the photograph but you know it's a jumping off point right yeah it shows how how it separates and you know that kind of uh way that those separate streams branch off and that kind of thing sure and then from there that's the original uh just the doodle right uh kind of a little thumbnail yeah. from there i kept refining that till i got to my actual uh drawing for it this is actually just a digital drawing that i did on the ipad and then this was a color study and not not every painting I go to this these pains. <laughs> this one I was just trying new things, and I thought, okay, I want to try to cover my bases uh, before I even get started. And it seems like a lot of of unnecessary steps, but uh, I feel that uh, ultimately it helps me to um, eliminate a lot of guesswork w when I get into the actual painting. You know, I've I've established so much that I can just paint and have fun at that point, you know? You think that it saves you time at all or just makes it so that it's it's less of a struggle? Um, I think that it may save some time in the long run. It may uh, actually, it may add on some time in certain instances, but I think that ultimately, like you said, less of a struggle and you work so much out. This this stage for me is always crucial personally. Um, this is the acrylic underpainting. And uh, this is where I really can dial it in, establish my values, um, just get all the necessary information on there. And then I can be an oil painting and it becomes a little a little less of a struggle because I've worked so much out. Okay, and so for the, the people that would ask, why not just continue with acrylic? What time is it, Dan? What um, reason for that? I don't know how to paint with acrylic very well. I mean, okay. this, this is this is different. I really work with the, the acrylic at this stage, almost like watercolor. It's watered down so much. When I'm, when I'm first laying it down, my uh my tones are like these very very light tones in the background here and i gradually build it up to my darks um and so it really allows me to really work out you know where where those deep shadows are going to be how they're going to sit and uh 
but I don't know. I just, I, I have a hard time blending with acrylics. Um, I've just, I've just always worked in oil. So I feel like this is the, the, I can be looser at this stage, a little more crude, um, because it's going to get dialed in later on, you know? So your answer really is for the purpose of blending. That's, that's why oil. Yeah. I like uh, just having that working time. One thing that I that I recently discovered, um, I, I usually use liquid fine detail, and I know that you've talked about how uh, that can sometimes be problematic because it gets real sticky. Um, it can start gumming up after a while, and I always feel like I'm racing that that uh, workable that working time before I know that it's the paint's gonna start seizing up. Well, I've been taking these uh, online, um, actually I wanna share some, some, uh, some online resources with everybody too. Um, there's this artist from Australia, Patrick Jones, and on his website, he has numerous uh, fantasy and anatomy um, virtual books but he also has movies that, and, and he does like basically uh, classes um, that you can just pay for, you know, whatever he might be like doing anatomy. We're gonna, he's gonna be working the hands and it's a class on, on just hand anatomy. Um, and they're really reasonably priced and it's a, an amazing amount of information that uh, it's like arts, uh, going to art school online at your leisure, you know? But anyhow, he was talking about how he uses linseed oil mixed in with liquid and uses like an 80% linseed oil to 20% liquid uh, ratio to keep that liquid from drying and letting him work it all day, but it'll dry by the next day, no problem. And uh, I started doing that and wow, what a difference. Hmm. Okay. And how long have you been using that mix? I think for two painting sessions now. So okay. real hasn't been long at all. But so far, so good. Yeah. So I think I emailed Sandy the list of these uh, books and uh, websites that people want to look into. Um, there's books on uh, fantasy art techniques. There's one book is uh, Fantasy Workshop by Boris Vallejo and Julie Bell. Um, I learned a, a whole lot from that. And then Patrick Jones, like I said, he has a sci-fi and fantasy art techniques book. A, uh, Leo? Yes. Leo, just letting you know, yeah, those are underneath um, the, uh, the videos. So everybody that's, uh, if you're looking for that, that should be on the... Um, reinventing the tattoo page under the video or as well as on the app under the video. Awesome. Thanks, Andy. No worries. And then there's a, there's a, a couple websites too with the downloadable books and art lesson movies that are just phenomenal. I'm, I, I've personally learned so much from, from watching these and, and studying that. Right on. Thank you for the list. Yeah. Thank you. Um, John Pricer is wondering, uh, Leo, how typically, typically, how many hours do you spend on your underpaintings? You know, they go fairly quick. This one took a little longer because it's a little bit bigger of a painting that I'm than I'm used to. So, um, this one probably took me uh, four, four days of painting. But typically I can usually get an underpainting done in about two days. Um, um, I can step away for a few minutes. Yeah. Two days of maybe like 
four to five hours a session. Leo, I'm going to need to step away for a couple minutes here, okay? Okay, no worries. Yeah, yeah, that's tremendous. So yeah, they can go like uh, they can go as quickly as like eight to ten hours to get an underpainting done. Right. That's quick for me anyway. You know, I was trying to get my light out of the way so that I didn't have so much of a glare, but I'm not getting enough light on my painting, so remedy that. Nice, that looks great. And Melissa Sink just joined us as well. Hi, Melissa. The Zoom link's out there if anybody wants to join us and show off their paintings as well. Yeah, feel free to jump on. Still trying to mess up my video. Sorry, guys. You working on something, Sandy? Um, I don't know if you can see too well on here. Uh, oh, cool. It's got a bunch of little mushrooms, and then this is going to be this, uh, this like kind of surreal woman's face with a bunch of eyeballs. Um, nice. Yeah, I started it at one point during one of our other uh, paint jams, and I hadn't gotten a chance to sit down and do anything to it, so I'm excited, and it fits the fantasy creature kind of thing so yeah yeah could have easily started something else i'm sure <laughs> almost like a green woman instead of the uh, green man what was that so it almost has like a green a green man feel but the green woman yeah totally i like that green man.
using some new brushes. So <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be a little bit of getting used to some different shapes. Mm -hmm. Do you have like a favorite shape that you usually go towards? You know, I like uh, predominantly use rounds. Um, yeah. Rounds and spotters, but I do like uh, I do like filberts and then flats for, you know, doing blocking in of large shapes and what have you. Yeah. I usually use filberts predominantly to uh, blend with. Okay. Do you like them dry? I think Guy was talking about like having dry ones to yeah, I blend like with. Dry brush. Um, I can even sometimes do like a spotting, uh, dabbing with the filbert on the edges of things. To yeah. Kind of uh, blend and fuzz out edges. Yeah. That is the nice thing about um, oils is all that pretty blending that you get to do. Yeah. I don't understand how some people get such beautiful, uh, smooth gradations with the acrylic. Um, seeing how, how fast it can make, you know. But they do. <laughs> they do, somehow. Yeah, yeah, I don't understand a lot of the stuff yet, <laughs> but uh, it's lots of fun. I guess maybe just painted in really, really thin layers and gradually built up. Are you are you doing acrylic or oil? Oils, yeah, yeah. I used to do acrylic. I mean, I used to just not really paint very much, but then I, I, I would try acrylic. I was scared of using oils, and. Uh, and then as soon as I tried oils, I was just like, oh my gosh, what was I waiting for? Yeah. So many people are intimidated by the fact that they, they take so long to dry, but man, there's so much that can be done with them exactly. because of that drying time. Yeah, it's like it was an intimidating part at first, but then once you actually play with it, you're like, oh, why would I want anything but that? Can't, can't learn to swim till you jump in the deep end. Wanting to do more uh, watercolor stuff too. Um, yeah, that's another cool one. Actually, that one I probably did more than acrylic before. Uh, yeah, it's funny too because my 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 approach with watercolors is totally different. Completely everything about it is different. Uh, you know, than, than when I work with oils. When I'm working with oils, I'm still thinking like. Fine art, right? Not to say that mm -hmm. watercolors aren't, but I've seen people do incredible yeah. things with it that it doesn't even look like watercolor. But I find that when I use watercolor, I end up going back to my tattoo techniques, and my watercolor stuff is definitely, uh, you know, tattoo influence. Yeah. Or, or you know, just that. Yeah, that makes sense. I would normally tattoo it finds its way into my watercolor stuff, which doesn't really so much with my oil painting. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's it's got definitely its own little challenges that you know, just if you want to have white in it, you have to think about that like well ahead of time. <laughs> They're very unforgiving, like uh yeah. Go in and paint over it. No. But uh, you got to nail it. 
Yeah, and I don't often think very far ahead with art, so I find that tough. But I, I, somehow it was like my favorite way to do it for a while. It's funny. So is there anybody in the chat that's uh, joining us painting, but maybe not feeling the Zoom call? And if so, what you painting tonight? Melissa Sink is getting set up. She's got a blank canvas tonight. Oh, something brand new. I was talking earlier about the uh, online resources for uh, you know learning and, and what have you and I just think that this is such a cool thing that you guys do um, you know not not just the paint jams but but all that guys put together with uh, the learning resources and stuff thank you yeah I I'm so happy that it's available, that we get to make it available for people and so much of it for free. Yeah. And it's so nice to be able to like connect and do art together when that's not really possible in all ways right now. Pretty grateful. So we just had Connor Foley is just connecting to audio. And then it's on here. It's <laughs> going with my painting, it's like jungle sounds back there. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can hear on your end, but my wife's like on the other side of the house in another room, uh, practicing her hurdy gurdy. Oh, cool. So it's like, uh, I got this cool medieval vibe going on in the background. <laughs> oh, that's cool. And then my partner's next to me playing the guitar. Uh, yeah. And then we've got little Kaya monkey going on in the back. <laughs> The hurdy gurdy, that's one of those, it's like uh, kind of like an, oh, I don't even know how to explain what I'm imagining, but I think it's a hurdy gurdy. Like a medieval instrument, you've got like a, a crank on it. Yeah. What an instrument it has a crank that kind of, uh, and then almost like, almost like a guitar neck with piano keys that, that it's, it's, a, it's a pretty intense instrument. 
see all the things and the all that's going on. Ooh, we got an alien going. Yeah, that's mine. So I messing with my webcam. I don't really have a super stable base for it, but super cool. Thanks, man. Bruno's just come on as well. Hi, Bruno. And Tavon's going to try and jump on to the Zoom too. So Connor, what are you using today? Are you using oils or acrylics? Um, I'm using acrylics. I kind of wish I would have went with oils now that I'm this far in this project, but kind of is what it is. I'm using like a big old piece of wood I found in the uh, garage and was like, oh, I could paint on this. <laughs> and so, nice. yeah, watering down the acrylics can kind of make it a little goofy, but I'm working with it. That's cool. Yeah, I did the first, uh, I don't know if you were at the uh, virtual tattoo gathering, um, but this summer, but uh, <laughs> for the first several paint jams, I was using acrylics and yeah. we were teaching with oils. <laughs> and so I was <laughs> like, man, it sounds so nice. Like they're just petting stuff on there. Oh, should right. I did that with uh, Bob Ross back in the day and was completely confused why none of the blending or anything worked anything like his <laughs> and yeah, realized exactly. that. <laughs> so since I was a kid, I've always uh, played you know, nerd games like D&D uh, &D and Warhammer, things like that. And right. I painted little miniature figurines. I still do it. I actually do uh, compete professionally doing that. For, for nice. But uh, the first time I ever painted a miniature, I could not for the life of me figure out why this one miniature with red on it would not dry. And it what? stained sticky and I tried to get the paint off and I repainted it and left it for a few days and went back and it was still sticky. I'm like, what is going on? Realized it was oil paint. <laughs> I, I, at that point, you know, I, I was real young and I didn't even know what oil paint was. I'm like, what is going on here? <laughs> Why? Yeah, if you didn't know what was going on, that'd be super frustrating. I painted the thing like four times. <laughs> oh. Yeah, those must be really like what do you use, like little tiny hair 
like uh, paintbrushes because I've seen those and they're very small. Yeah, use like zeros on down to 10 zero. Nice, wow. Um, Arturo is in the chat room and he's wondering what type of machine do you use for lining and do you have any tips for pulling off clean lines? So I guess he's talking about tattoos. Does he talk to anybody in particular? What was that? Is, that, is he just is he talking to anybody in particular or is he just a general question? Oh, he's talking to, to you, Leo. Um, I tend to use I've been really into uh, black cloth cartridges lately, um, being that uh, I, I haven't used coil machines in quite a while. I, and there's a part of me that misses it, but just ergonomically, I it, coil machines just kill my hands at this point, you know. So uh, I'm using uh, rotaries and. Uh, Lately, I've been using Black Claws uh, tight nines and straight nines for lining for the most part. I'll use a, a five bug pin as well for, for real tight stuff. Nice. And Tavon's joined us on the Zoom as well. Oh, what's up, man? He may or may not uh, have sound. Um, I know that sometimes it's been on and off lately, but okay. can we hear you, Tavon? Uh, am I there? Can you guys hear me now? We yes, can hear sir. you. Hey. Howdy. How's it going? Good. How are you, bro? I'm doing good. Doing good. I'm uh, still just kind of mapping out what I what I did pull together at the last minute. Oh, <laughs> yeah. nice. How big is that? Yeah. Oh, it's. I mean, it, oh, it's it's, it's, it's on digital on and it's. Oh, uh, cool, cool. Yeah. Yeah. When you do those digital uh, pieces, do you typically have a, a certain size that you normally work in or do you just do screen size? Um, it, it depends on what I'm doing really. Yeah. Um, I've, I've been trying, like if I'm just doing something that's just gonna be more, more of like a, you know, I know it's gonna be a quick sketch and that I'm not gonna put a whole lot of time into, I'll probably try and do it smaller. Uh -huh. um, but if I, if I want to put a lot of time into it and make it something that I can maybe print later on or whatever, uh, I'll try and think, think about that and make it a larger size. Okay. Yeah. That stuff's all brand, brand, brand new to me. <clears throat> yeah. I'm still figuring it out. I mean, I've been doing digital for maybe five or six years now, I think. Maybe more than that, even maybe about seven or eight, but uh, it's it's still a learning process. <laughs> I've been kicking myself like, man, why did I have such a hang up about that for so long? Because it's such a useful tool, man. Yeah, a lot of people are weary about it. It's interesting. <clears throat> well, maybe not so much anymore, but. <clears throat> all right i'm back <clears throat> oh that's cool so whose screen are we seeing here hey hey so who's the uh the hydra is that jason I think we've got, uh, that's Tavon. Oh, Tavon. Hey, right on. Oh, hey. 
How's it going? It's going good. How's your web connection tonight? Has, has your sound been okay? Nice. Sounds it, like you're cutting out a little it's bit. It's a little spotty. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least we're able to see what you're yeah. doing. It looks really cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Kaya was doing a Hydra too. She had to go to bed. Uh, yeah, let me grab it. So, pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, thing out. Oh, nice. Yeah, that, uh, oh, nice. This head in particular, I thought it was pretty cool. Oh, that's awesome. But yeah, she was already overtired when she started it. <laughs> but yeah, she's doing this easel challenge with us and trying to do 31 paintings. And so far, she's done like three paintings a day. Damn. Damn. Yeah, which has been cool. It's like uh, he's gotten so familiar with uh, the uh, digital stuff. I mean, with analog <clears throat> stuff, that it's like she's able to bust things out as easily as if she were using Procreate. Awesome. Nice. <clears throat> So, yeah, for a long time, I've been uh, working out of, because, yeah, you know, I've, I've been painting quite a bit, but I haven't done any, like, serious soul searching in terms of my palette recently. And uh, I'm sure I'll get there eventually, but I've been working out of the same bag of oil paints. It's like this, this old freezer bag uh, with sort of some odd colors but it's you know i've kind of got a triad going there you know i've got a, a rose color i've got ochre uh and i've got this sort of off blue and then i've got you know a little bit of you know some yellows and things like that but uh, i've been working out of the same bag forever and then with this particular painting it's even more monochrome than that so a lot a lot of these uh paintings i've been doing this month have been just Payne's gray, <clears throat> other gray that's sort of this light opaque gray called gray of gray. And, uh, and then um, uh, ochre. I've done a lot of paintings with just those three and a little bit of white. It's wild how many things you can get done with just that. <clears throat> yeah, well, the, uh, the ochre and the paints give you a warm and a cool. And the gray of gray gives you a nice sort of like neutral foundation uh, that, that you can work around everything. Yeah, and then just using different, uh, like more of the ochre on a certain thing and more of the gray on a certain thing, then it's like you, you barely even notice that there was all just the same colors. Right. Yeah. It's, it's kind of interesting how, and like, if your palette is limited enough, I think the viewer just after a certain point suspends their disbelief and just starts seeing the whole range. Yeah. It's just funny. You know, it's the thing that I do um, usually when I paint is uh, whatever color is going to be dominant in my painting. I try to add a little bit of that color to every mix, no matter, even to white, it'll have a, the slightest little dab of whatever that color is. Ah. Just seems to, for me, it seems to unify the painting, no matter what colors I'm using it, you know, because you have a little mix of that in there. The, the, the one that I'm doing right now is predominantly a lot of Naples yellow in it. so. Every single mix on here has a little dab of Naples yellow, even mm -hmm. like my stuff that's almost black. It, it, there's a little dab of it in there. Well, it makes sense. Uh, you know, there's this this other school of thought, which is in you know putting a little bit of your complement in in the colors that you're using. Where uh, you know it was interesting because I'm a, I'm a little bit colorblind and I always struggle with this stuff, especially reds and greens. I was doing an apple the other night, uh -huh. and it didn't start to look right. 
until I went back through all the reds with little bits of green. Mm. Yeah, that apple ended up looking like a more of an apple than the apple that you were painting. <laughs> that was hard. That was unaccountably hard. That was kind of <laughs> hard it was to paint the apple. I thought, oh, this is this be easy peasy. I'll just give myself an just apple. An apple. <laughs> No, Humans were painting apples for thousands of years. <laughs> How hard could it be? Whoa. <laughs> All right. Is that the sound of somebody dropping in? It was not. <laughs> I think that might have been a message on my iPad. Ah. Somebody was... somebody just cast a spell. <laughs> There's magic going on. Magic is afoot. <laughs> um, Leo, you were saying that you uh, have played like D&D. &D. Have you ever been the um, dungeon master or do you generally, um, are you generally? We have, a, we have a group that's been going for, I don't know, about four years now. Nice. And, uh, we have a guy who's normally running it, but when he burns out, we'll have a, a month or so that I'll take over it when a small thing nice. him a break. But it's a lot of work to do that. Yeah, definitely. I've never uh, played it, but I had a friend that was very much into it and plays a lot of other, like she does LARPing and stuff and the vampire masquerade. And oh, cool. um, it's really cool to like watch and listen to, but I, I was like, man, that is, you got to be. I don't know. You got to be confident, or how? I don't know. I've never felt very confident about joining in on those. I'm fine when I'm playing with other nerds and I'm, you know, in the comfort. Yeah. But if there's, like, if my wife has friends over or something, I always feel <laughs> super dorky. <laughs> yeah, totally. I like watch and listen to, but I, I was like, man, that is. Oh. There we go. We've been playing a game called uh, a role playing game called Call of Cthulhu. Um, oh yeah! It's been an ongoing campaign that I think we're like three years in now. We have maybe about another year before it we finally. Uh... <clears throat> that's that's my dedicated Monday night. Nice. Yeah, I think my friend has mentioned that one because she loves role-playing games and also the sea so <laughs> pretty, pretty yeah she makes these uh really cool underwater um uh jewelry no. <laughs> that are like very nautical themed and yeah her husband and her actually met during a larping for the vampire the masquerade so they were both dressed up as zombie vampires and that's how they met and they fell in love so it's pretty like if you can fall in love while you're both zombie vampires it's pretty good turn material right there <laughs> <laughs> zombie vampires <laughs> yeah. why not why not <laughs> I've just always been obsessed with this stuff since I was a kid. Remember, there, uh, there's been a few defining moments in my life that I look back on and, and see how the trajectory changed at that moment, you know? Yeah. And one of them was being uh, at the mall with my parents, and we passed by this store that had all these little metal figurines in the window. And I remember just being enthralled and my parents like trying to tear me away from this window. I'm like, come on, I go. And I was like, what is this? And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's never left me. It has been as big a part of my life as art has been uh, since I was a kid, man. And it's, so cool. and it's informed my art, you know? Heck yeah, fantasy. Definitely, it makes it so you can play around with reality a lot, mm -hmm. which is 
definitely super fun to be able to do. The term there's a uh, Patrick and Jeannie Wilshire, this couple out in Pennsylvania that put on this amazing uh, show called the Lexicon, and it's all fantasy, sci-fi, art. Um, and they coined the term imaginative realism. Mm. And it's, it's gaining traction. And there's, uh, before Luxcon, there wasn't really much of a market for a lot of these artists outside of just illustration gigs, you know, doing book covers and games and things like that. But uh, Luxcon came around and all of a sudden there's collectors uh, coming from all over world, the world to attend, the, to attend this. There's more conventions around it uh, springing up. And now there's huge prestigious gallery shows all over the world. Uh, again, coining that term, imaginative real, <clears throat> stepping away from it just being fantasy art. But uh, That's cool. I like that imaginative. It's funny, art. like what's in a name, you know? But uh, yeah. I, I think part of the problem is, is that uh, any genre that's, survived as long as fantasy art has is going to have some stigmas attached to it sure. mm -hmm. right and you know the idea of it being cheesy or dated or you know kind of 1980s oriented or whatever uh, it would be easy to jump to that conclusion if you haven't been paying attention to what people have been doing recently mm -hmm. um and uh yeah mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a completely different story now and so it kind of does deserve a new name Mm -hmm. doesn't bring up that uh, same idea for everybody anymore we have that you know we did on that one one of the painting panels where we were talking about uh illustration versus the uh, you know fine art and uh right. i had you know spoken up about you know, what was michelangelo but an illustrator you know <laughs> You know, a lot of classical Renaissance art was that borderline fantasy art. Totally. Yeah, well, it, exactly. It's like, it, you know, and, and of course, not everybody would agree with this. You would raise some controversy by saying it, but the difference between religious art and fantasy art is only in the idea that people believe one book and not the other. You know, yeah. they're both books with with stories that include elements you wouldn't see in ordinary regular day life. Right. And uh, you know, allow for, you know, some fairly fantastic depictions. Uh -huh. Totally. Like the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, mine's not fantasy art because it's got cherubs, little flying babies. Those are real, though. Your right. unicorn, not so much. <laughs> I was just looking at one of those medieval paintings. Um, it's it's so funny because some of them are so beautiful, but then you can they've they've come out with all those collections of like, oh, here's the ones that you know aren't aren't being put into museums uh, as beautiful pieces of art because they were just like so goofy looking. And I don't know if everybody's seen that one, but there's this one with uh, horses in it. And there's a horse from the side and it looks like a very normal horse from the side. And then the one from the front is just absolutely like, how did you never see a horse from the front? Like, could you not have guessed? And the, the quote on it is like, uh, yeah, so I'd like you to draw me two horses. You, you know how to draw a horse from the front, right? And the artist says, yeah. <laughs> and, oh, I, I, should, I should post it in, on the app uh, after this because it is just, Yeah, yeah, I'd love to see it. It is calm. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's a fairly well-known Albrecht Dürer uh, drawing of a rhinoceros. <laughs> and he did it entirely from a description, a verbal description. Oh my gosh. And he drew it in an immaculate detail, right? Because he knew how to draw detail, but uh, he's never actually seen a rhino. And uh, it's, it's cool looking, right? But it's 
a little, a little bit of a fantasy creature. <laughs> Look that one up too. Yeah, I think I'm just gonna get both of those. So, what it was, Ulbricht. Ulbricht Durer, D U R E R. You know, I think it would be interesting to see how history treats, um, you know, people like Frazetta or Giger. Is that stuff going to make it into the art history books, you know, being, being taught at, you know, the university level or what have you, um, you know, 50 years from now? Yeah, that's a very good question. Because no. they absolutely belong in that. Right. But for example, Giger, a lot of people, their main exposure to him is through Alien. And so they would see him as being like responsible for this film design. And that would be his place in history as a film design guy. Right. You know which is, you know, just not even remotely close to what he actually was. But uh, as yeah. far as culture is concerned, there are these kind of interpretations that happen. Sure. Well, you think about, you know, so many artists that are, are started, started a movement or there's a, uh, a certain school of art that is, you know, associated with them, like Pablo and Pablo Picasso and uh, Cubism and Dali with uh, Surrealism, you know, Van Gogh and Impressionism, things like that. And I'm like, well, we have biomechanics today and it's become a part of the everyday artistic language for so many artists. And that was something that, you know, he established and deserves credit in the history books. Right, if there is any justice in the world at all. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Which is sometimes very questionable. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I've got our rhinoceros and our horse. So all right. Yeah, the second one. Oh, yeah. Nah. Badass. Cool, right? I mean, it's the face is not bad, <clears throat> right? <laughs> but it's, yeah, close. it's cooler than <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's awesome. I love all the patterns on it. You've got like a little horn horn on its uh, neck there. Oh yeah. Shoulders. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but imagine him just sitting with his friend, his buddy, like you know, having his fifth drink. He's like, Yeah, that look kind of like these circular scales on the belly. Right. Yeah, <laughs> like that. Yeah. But then they sort of fade off a little bit. Yeah, like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and his hooves are like. <laughs> oh, it looks like he's, <laughs> he's got some sweet stuff going on over like, his chin and stuff. <clears throat> okay, so much less uh, pleasant looking will be the horse once I can get this to. <laughs> Here we I'm go. Dance. There, there's the. Uh, oh, oh God. There's the horse. <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh my goodness humpty so horse. Yeah, eggs and horses are the same thing <laughs> right like, whoa. Horse. there's no difference <laughs> oh, I, I just love i love, i looked at this piece of this Who picture for like the so long I don't, I don't, it's like one of those ones where it's not necessarily signed, but it is something, oh. an actual museum, I've confirmed uh, that it, that it is an official medieval piece of art. It wasn't just somebody like <laughs> trying to make fun of it or anything. Yeah, but no, no artist's name to it. <laughs> no one gets credit, bummer. No. <laughs> <laughs> just scratched out there. Both, both the curse and the blessing. Yeah. All right. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I just love that so much. You know how to draw a little horse from the front, right? Yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah, and of course, Durer, he was just a really good artist. So even though he had no idea what yeah. he was doing, he could just make it look good. 
yeah it still looks cool and like yeah that animal could exist even if it's not exactly like that i could imagine it exists like that well i mean there might have been 300 years where like the majority of europe thought that was a rhinoceros you know <laughs> totally they see a rhinoceros oh, in your yeah. life they're like oh <laughs> Our finest naturalist, Albrecht Durer, you've seen his rabbit, right? It looks exactly like a rabbit, so here's his rhinoceros. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that's so funny. Oh, it's kind of like a police sketch. Exactly. You know, like he did that all off just a description, and he came pretty close. Like, that's pretty good. Yeah, if you had to find that rhinoceros, you know, for a police matter, you'd find it. Yep. That I'd see one and check. I'm no zoologist, <laughs> but that <was> close. <laughs> that's about as close as it's going to get, I think. At one time, I was out, hey, I was in my 20s. I was out just drinking with some friends, and one of them was like, let's, let's go back to my place. My wife should be like, done peeking by now i'm like oh really okay <laughs> so we she's like honey i just got visited by aliens they uh, they give me a full pelvic examination I'm like really can we like try to do the police sketch thing she's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> so for two hours i sat there and drew this alien as she was like yeah the mouth make it just a little narrower but you know it was exactly your your gray alien you know what i mean it was yeah like, to a T, your classic gray. There's nothing <laughs> different about it at all. It was fun. Though. Awesome. Oh my gosh, she must be done peeking. You're like, I'm sorry, what? She's just been hanging out there by herself. <laughs> oh. That'd be quite the job doing the, the police sketches. Holy smokes. Yeah, and I think they're doing it all with, with digital tools now. Oh, of course. Even every department might not be, but, you know, like, they yeah. can just drop a different nose on and, you know, yeah. make it larger, smaller, <laughs> wider. You know, it's kind of funny. It's kind of like when you're making your me and your we game, except, <laughs> you know, you have way more features to choose from. Yes, like a super uh -huh. detailed version of that. <laughs> They no longer look so Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> yeah, I think I might be forced to keep this thing a lot more loose than I've made the other ones this week, but I've been trying to get loose. And, uh, I know Leo is not the person to ask about this. <laughs> you know, but, uh, that's an exercise I need to force myself to do. Yeah. I think that it would benefit. That's what I've been focusing on a lot lately, too. It doesn't come naturally when you tattoo and, you know, normally <laughs> it's not encouraged, right? Yeah. I'm trying to dial that stuff in. Exactly. Yeah. But, you know, I was thinking about the other day when we uh, did our, our frog drawings. I was <laughs> making everybody work so fast. <laughs> but uh, I like that, you know, I, I enjoy that. I hope that's not too much of a pain for people. But uh, normally, there's no no guideline at all for how long something should take, right? So yeah. every time you open up a sketchbook page or whatever, you in theory could, you know, be embarking on something that, that could be two weeks long. <laughs> I've been uh, appreciating the fastness for the for the exercises, um, and then and then just like trying to keep it loose enough that I'm actually finishing it by the time we're back to Monday. So I definitely yeah. want a good exercise for me. <laughs> I found that that's like a thing that I can do when I'm 
I know I'm going to be on the phone for a while. So I'll just get one of those out and work on it. Yes. So yeah, I got to do the frog, with the toad rather. <laughs> Yeah, I had a lot of fun with the toad. Yeah. Tavon, you had so much fun. You did all four of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't decide which one I liked the best. And uh, for some reason, I just couldn't sleep that night. So I'm like, might as well use the time. And yeah, did four of them. And I'll, I'll probably actually pick one and work on it a little bit tomorrow before tomorrow night. Nice. Holy moly. Yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to our, our finals project for this round because, uh, you know, I want to really, like, combine all the tricks. Yeah. Yeah. Every now and then I'll, you know, I'll do a tattoo where I'm really following all of my own advice. <laughs> but it's always... <laughs> A little bit of a push to, I mean, it's just like, you know what healthy eating is, right? Does that mean that every meal that you make is going to be healthy eating? No. no. Uh, <laughs> and it's kind of the same thing when we, when we, when we tattoo, we know in our mind what would be perfect, uh, you know, if we were to be a perfect straight A student with every single thing that we did, <laughs> but that's not, not reality. Totally. So Melissa just joined us as well. All right. Hey, Melissa. Hey, guys. Hi. Are you working on something that you had in progress or is this a new? Well, I had this line drawing of this creature and I was debating about working on the oil painting that I've been working on. I thought this fitted a little bit more. Um, so I don't have any paint on there just yet. <laughs> um, but well, this is the, the gist. I'll be pulling nice. this up so I can get sky and whatnot in because I have not gessoed. Um, nice. But according to this, it's pre-primed. <clears throat> so what's the plan for the background? Um, I'm sticking with roughly the same kind of landscape as the uh, elements final that we did. Okay. Um, I don't oh. know if the colors will be the same or not, but because that's sitting at the sitting out at my shop on display at the moment. I think that my my main question would just be: Is there any reason the creature is not bigger in the composition? <laughs> I didn't want it to take up the whole composition, and I didn't want it to be centered. Okay. All right. <clears throat> I mean, especially if you're planning on doing cool stuff with the background, you know, like with Leo's Manticore, there's, you know, you, you need to dedicate some surface area to that. Right on. Yeah, I feel like I remember you having that, um, that creature laid out as a possible thing to add to the uh, finals. Yeah, it was just a little too busy to do it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that would have been too much. <clears throat> I, I think we all had our hands full just trying to get the elements. <laughs> right. so. Yeah, I, I tend to bite off a little bit more than I can chew. <laughs> oh, yeah, I feel you. I'm, I'm definitely just finishing something that I started on one of our other things and had no chance to. <laughs> you know, biting off too much, as long as it's not in terms of like your tattooing abilities, um, mm -hmm. that's the time. I think that's actually a good, good habit because otherwise mm -hmm. you're probably somebody that stays in your comfort zone a lot. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, typically try to challenge myself with tattoos with painting I I tend to go a little bit above and beyond but that's because I don't mm -hmm. really have a good grasp of capabilities yet <laughs> yeah um I used to work in dry medium so paint is is a new thing dry medium oh dry mediums like uh, pencils and yeah yeah 
yeah, that was always my big favorite one was pencils and um, and then ink and pencil crayon, watercolor okay. pencil crayon. Mm. I did a lot of charcoal of that for about 17 years. Nice. Yeah, charcoal does have some, uh, I think, parallels with painting, you know, in, in that, you know, once you've put it down, you can blend it and kind of work it a little bit, lift it and move it around some. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I've never really gotten, tried too much of it. I should probably do a, a charcoal zoom thing one of these times. That'd be cool. These have been the reason that I've tried oils and it's definitely, definitely something I'm very happy that I've gotten into now, so. Yeah, I definitely would love to have a couple really good watercolor artists come on here and uh, instruct <laughs> us. Yeah, oh, that would be great. Definitely. Love to get Dan Marshall. Dan Marshall. Dan Marshall is a former tattooer. He actually worked with uh, Paul Booth for uh, a chunk of time there. He was there with Tim Kern and Jeremiah Barba. And uh, yeah, he, he is completely, you know, gone from like dark artist to very classic uh, um, watercolor painter. And he's just incredible. <clears throat> incredible. That's interesting. People's evolution. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> there's so few of us that, that leave tattooing and move on to other things. Mm. Uh. I think that, you know, it's, it's hard to uh, read in these. I think a lot of people who've gotten used to being an artist with a steady paycheck, mm -hmm. they leave tattooing and they are right back to it. I'm not <laughs> okay, that was interesting. <laughs> yep. And that's the beauty of tattooing is it's like you can still do all of, like we're, we're able to do all of these art forms and if you want you can try and sell them and stuff but it's like if it's not your only bread and butter then it's a lot easier yes yes you're not going to go hungry mm -hmm. Yeah, that was definitely one of the things that i read about when i was young and i was reading about artists lives there's so many of the, the great, you know, the big names in art history. Uh, Rembrandt being one of them, Monet, Van Gogh, of course. And these guys all starved, you know. They all had financial yeah. problems, uh, problems with the tax man. Uh, yeah. And I think one big mistake that some of them make, made, and I think this was, Monet and Rembrandt, and I've always tried to take this to heart. Just because you have a stellar year doesn't mean you should say, okay, that's my yearly income from now on. <laughs> and, you know, then go and sign a mortgage on a house and, you know, buy a powerboat while you're at it. Yeah. Uh, better to just say, okay, I had a great year. Hopefully next year will be as good. Yeah. Uh, keep your expectations dialed down a little bit you know it's like rap stars they they're notorious for you yeah. know i want a house of 27 stripper poles no 50 stripper poles <laughs> and then you know that particular album sales start to slow down a little bit you're like oh no i gotta put out another album and then that mm -hmm. one doesn't go as well yeah. they don't they don't you know put out the hits as easily and uh yeah all of a sudden uh, they've been in and out of this house in three years. Yeah. Maybe that's, yeah. I just always like whenever I see a lot of rappers, especially nowadays, they all just have like horrific tattoos. And I'm like, you make so much money and you like brag about how much money you have. And then you go and get somebody to tattoo you. And it's like, crap, why? Why? 
Okay, same with athletes, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> it's because of tattooers that end up on the tour bus. Uh, there you go. <laughs> right? And these are not going to be a really good, well-established artist yeah. who own shops and are, you know, married with kids or whatever. These are going to be the young ones that can do that, right? That's a really uh, good point. And they're not necessarily going to be great, but they might be able to give these folks what they think they want. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. you want a Lakers logo? I'll do those all day long. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Totally. That's a really good point. So I think that's totally <laughs> yeah it, it should bother you it's it, it, it ain't right it's like come on no, no. there's really good people out there tons of them like more than you could ever count and you've got yeah. that on. You and know, actually got got money. <laughs> oh. it's also like unique ribs and and uh, once in a while there's somebody that has a really cool setup you know but a lot of the time I'm like, man, they're, with that kind of money, I would have like Harry Houdini, Scooby-Doo craziness in my house. <laughs> You'd have some like bookshelves that open up the, the door to your basement kind of thing. I'd have the guy hired just to sit in the wall behind the painting with the eyes. And the people. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I mean, I'd rather have that than the TV that, you know, levitates off your bed. <laughs> right, that's for your life. Totally. Well, a lot of people just don't have much imagination when it comes to this stuff. No. Totally. Yeah, I remember um, my friend and I, we always imagined having a house together and it was going to have... Uh, a giant um, walnut shell, like half walnut shell that we would have <laughs> to create so that you could get into it. And then there'd be a pulley system that you'd have to pull yourself up, up to the second floor with. And I was like, man, why aren't all houses just like that? So cool. Well, and you're like, oh, I'm going to have to try and make that. Yeah, right. I'll have to wait until I'm mega rich. <laughs> yeah, it's hard enough even just coming up with like a cool like stair rail or something like that um, yeah. once you get into home ownership and you start doing the really fancy stuff that's the other thing if you customize your house too much michelle and i are really guilty of this you end up with something that nobody can repair but you uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? Like, that was great <laughs> yep Now, Lyle Tuttle said it well. He said, oh, let me tell you something, guy. For every improvement, there's maintenance. <laughs> because he was, uh, I'd heard that he was working on a pond that he'd gotten a, some kind of a backhoe when he was making a pond on his property in California. I asked him about it, and that was his answer. <laughs> and uh, he gave up on it. And I don't blame him. Yeah, uh, because right now that we've been at this place since '96, and we've done a lot of really custom stuff to it. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> right now is one of those stretches of time where there's a lot of maintenance going on. Mm -hmm. A lot of that stuff has rotted through the years, and then, you know, no one will fix it but me. And it all has too darn cut. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. We just built a pond this past year and it's awesome, but man, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Like to keep well, up. That is, it. that is if you maintain it the right way, you know, which mm -hmm. we never really did. Yeah, we were thinking about putting in a pond as well. They're so nice. <laughs> Well, one of the problems that happened with ours is beavers moved in. Oh, and, oh that's right. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, 
we're compassionate people and, and animal lovers. And, you know, I haven't eaten meat since 1998. And it's like, well, oh, okay. <laughs> Let's just let them live there for a while and see what happens. And then six months later, they've taken over the second pond. It's like, okay, oh my God. kind of war now. And <sighs> so we hired a trapper, you know, with the idea that we were paying him extra to live trap them and, and move them elsewhere. Yeah. And, you know, so every time one ended up in the trap, I'd call him and I'd help him go out there and snare him. And, and these, these are some seriously large rodents, you know, oh and pissed off. And, uh, you know, one of them was 65 pounds. Holy smoke. Yeah. I mean, my <laughs> daughter is 65 pounds and she can kick my ass. Um, <laughs> she doesn't have crazy so teeth. That yeah, and they would get snared by the tail, and you, you know, get out there an hour later, and there's an eight or ten foot circle of just mud where they've destroyed everything, oh. trying to get loose. And so, you know, we went through this whole wrenching process of moving this whole family of beavers, and you know, oh, okay. four months later, we've got new beavers. Like, no. Okay, mm-hmm. I guess I guess we we have beavers. You know. <laughs> uh, and I think that, that what they'll tell you, if you want your pond to last, you don't want them. But, uh, yeah. Huh. But, yeah, what are you supposed to do? Yeah. If, I, if you actually killed them, then there'd be new beavers. So it's like, what's the, yeah. You just have to, like, get ready to kill lots of beavers. And, oh, yeah, God. That's, just, that's not my thing. No, that's not my thing. I in your pond, man. <laughs> well, I actually figured it out. Like, if, if I could start all over again and, and was a rich dude that could call in the excavators to redo the whole pond, which by, by the way, would be about 15 or 20 grand. Yeah. Um, there's places where the beavers can build their lodge without damaging the pond. They just don't choose those places. Uh, so if I were to bury chain lick fencing three inches under the dirt, in all the places where we don't want beavers and not put the chain link fencing in the places where it's okay for them to reside, um, then uh, they might actually settle into the right places. So, uh, yeah, in a different life where, where I'm at liberty to mess around with things like that. Yeah. Holy moly. Beavers. I wouldn't have even prepared to think about beavers being there. Well, it's funny because, you know, they're especially active in the wintertime. So, like, if I were to go out there right now, it's possible I'd hear the chewing sound. It's kind of like... <laughs> and you wait a minute, and then uh, if you catch them at the right time, you'll then hear the timber sound, <laughs> the tree coming down. Whoa. Uh, yeah, they're, they're going hard at it this time of year. Interesting. Yeah. But yeah, long story short, you are correct. There is is maintenance involved. <laughs> no idea that they were more active in the uh, winter. Yeah. Um, I think that during the summer they can just graze anytime they want. They can be like, "I'm hungry. I'm going to go and chew on something." But when the entire landscape is frozen, sure. <clears throat> uh, I also think that they try to avoid going out as much as they can mm. so that they don't get bobcatted or whatever <clears throat> and uh so what they do is they uh during the winter they'll just take a bunch of trees down uh, and uh chop them up into 18 inch lengths which they then bury in the mud under the pond and uh it's like a refrigerator and they'll just go and grab these logs and and that they're bark eaters. That's that's where they get their nutrition. Interesting. Uh, I actually didn't know that. I, I thought that they just chewed it up. <laughs> yeah, they're they're bark eaters. And they uh oh, I could go on and on about fascinating beaver facts, but that's not why we're here tonight. <laughs>
Yeah, I've never been a person that's felt inclined to shoot anything on our landscape, uh, even though it's not all convenient. Yeah. Like the, the vulture family is another one. Uh, they were here first. There's yeah. a derelict barn in the back of the property and they live there, but they just happen to love the tattoo studio. So they hang around the tattoo studio and, uh, and they crap on the stoop. Oh God. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, pretty gnarly actually. It's, you know, it's bird poop. It's just white and liquid, but you know, still. The bigger uh, the bird. Well, and they tap dance in it. <laughs> they, they wash their legs with it. Oh, lovely. I guess it's better than, than the carcass stuff that's otherwise stuck to their legs. Fair uh, enough. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, they, uh, they leave these little footprints that look like cartoon skeleton bird feet. Actually, perfect. <laughs> But yeah, oh, the other day uh, I was interviewing Tommy Lee uh, Wentner and the whole time I'm trying to talk to him and keep a straight face and there's a vulture <laughs> dance going on. Uh, there's three of them outside and one of them, and, and yeah, these guys have a seven foot wingspan. Okay, they've all got their wings out, right? They're hopping around right outside the window, <laughs> hopping around and going berserk. But one of them is doing this weird thing where he's got his legs bent and uh, you know their knees go backwards, right? And his legs are bent, and he's just hopping around and making this nah, 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 kind of sound. <laughs> and uh, this went on the, most of the time while I was doing the interview. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. That's hilarious. Wild. You got like mutual of Omaha. <laughs> Yeah, um, Jordan Rookus was just talking about the vultures at your place uh, on uh, the yeah. tattoo collecting podcast. He was talking about like just laying there, getting his tattoo, and looking out at the the couple of vultures and how beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> also, yeah, they live like fifty years, fifty, sixty years. Wow! So this family has been here before we got here. And uh, they'll put out a pair of chicks every couple of years. And the chicks look like uh, cream colored fuzzy basketballs with black snake heads coming out of the top. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're talking about fancy creatures. <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're full on Skeksis. They really are. Yes. I was just thinking that about some turkeys that I saw yesterday. Like you are skexies, little tiny skexies. Man, I have not figured out eyes yet with paint, and mm -hmm. I gave this creature like a friggin' million of them. Where's them? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So just out of curiosity, I just recently ordered a bunch of paint pens. These are acrylic, basically markers, acrylic paint markers. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to see if that is to, to work details. What brand are they? Uh, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. I ordered a couple different ones. I remember uh, hanging around with Klaus. Um, I, I was hanging around with Klaus Fuhrman at a convention, and he had a bunch of paintings that he had done using the paint markers. They were pretty cool. I mean, it looks it looks. I mean, the lines are all very uniform in thickness, so you could tell that it was not a brush. Mm -hmm. It's a different look, and it either improves or it doesn't. So I guess I guess I'll find out. Mm -hmm. Probably it would be, you know, a good underpainting tool. I'm kind of a purist when it comes to the way the finished 
the finish of the painting looks. Mm -hmm. It to be pretty, uh, pretty classic and pretty consistent. Oh. Oh boy. Mm-hmm. Dinner's done. <laughs> so how's everybody's coming along? Uh especially the uh folks who started something tonight. I finally got my canvas covered. Uh should we take a minute to spotlight? It's, sure. At this point, it's just four of us. There is six people on here. Oh, six of us. Nice. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Melissa's here. Let's okay. see. So I'm going to start with yours, Guy. You're on the first thing here. It's pretty loose. I don't know. It doesn't look like much yet. But you can tell that it's some kind of a egg clutching deep thing. Yeah, yeah that's where we're at so far. The eggs are starting to really come together for sure. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to do a painting of eggs tomorrow. Yes. Just because that's another one like an apple. I'm probably going to get my ass kicked, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> Vulture? <laughs> no, these are just chicken eggs that the lady down the street has been bringing us. Uh, I'll probably, in fact, I'll give her the painting of the eggs because what else am I going to do with a painting of eggs, right? But I'll give the lady that's been giving us eggs. That's nice. All right, Leo, I'm on yours now. Really on this tail. Oh, wow. Nice. Nice. So you're giving it a lot of the shine tonight. Yeah, I mean, it's still, it's still in its very loose, uh, uh, base coat stage basically I'll, I'll yeah is he going to pick up a little bit more contrast still yeah <clears throat> eyes all cook on and polish it up better that's so cool the sky behind it just looks so beautiful too yeah i, I just love the atmosphere of it mm -hmm. thank you um, so we've got Connor Foley on there. I'm bringing you up now. Oh, wow. My camera looks terrible. <laughs> it's a little dark. Yeah, I found it in the uh, closet, so that's... Let me see if it's a little better if I move it a bit. I mean, that seemed to get a good... It's a pretty big one, so. Mm -hmm. that. Uh, going through and doing just some, just some white to pull some shapes forward and kind of playing with stuff. Oh. And just messing with textures on like the arm and face and such. Nice. Is this oil or acrylic? This is acrylic. What size is it? What's the size of it? Yeah. I don't know the exact bit, but I mean, I, where's my hand? That's my hand. So nice. It's big. Oh, wow. Yeah. Good yeah, size. I really wish it was oil right now, for bonding's sake, but you know, it's just taking a little longer than it. You can always do a final pack in oils. Yeah, I could actually. That actually might be the move. Nice. But yeah, <clears throat> the better camera. That is really bad. <laughs> like, Tavon, I'm bringing you up now. Awesome. We. Yeah. yeah that's Taking shades. Pretty loose, but just kind of working it out. 
That's really kind of sweet. Nice. Yeah, it's got a, a great mood to it already. Yeah, I, I like the lighting the most. That's probably the most striking thing about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's hard to nail that kind of uh, moon lighting. Yeah, I mean, that was, uh, let's see, what was, uh, well, I, I put a layer down and uh, brought back the opacity on it. And then, uh, so I just filled it in all, all dark blue and then brought the opacity down and then just started erasing it. Uh, okay, yeah. But, <clears throat> yeah, that's fun. Have I already asked you if you follow James Gurney? Um, I believe I do. Um, I follow so many people, it's so hard to keep track of everyone, but. Right, right, yeah. 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 His posts are cool though, because he always explains what he's doing. And uh, he had a really cool post about uh, painting uh, moonlit scenes, you know, hmm. advice on, on keeping them clear and readable and uh, making the most out of the very limited color and light that you have available. Yeah, yeah. I've actually been trying to focus on that a lot lately. It's like using less color and just trying to be able to get the, uh, you know, a lot of depth and, you know, mostly just uh, using darks and light, basically. Yeah, so then, you know, color is sort of like almost a, a bonus after that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. So, Melissa, I'm going to add you on here now. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Sorry, I've got a bit of background noise. I'm loving the color. So, are you going to add the, the figure after that's dry? That's yeah. Dry? I am. Um, tend to find it easier to not have to like cookie cutter around things mm -hmm. um and because it wasn't like because i didn't prime the panel or the canvas uh because i ran out of time i figured i'd just do an acrylic underpainting and then roll with oil at a later point nice. yep. well, so, so that's I've, acrylic then yeah this is all acrylic at the moment okay All right, and this is where I'm at at the moment. There we go. I haven't gotten too much farther. <laughs> Another mushroom has arrived, and I'm just meticulously trying these friggin' eyeballs. There are so many of them, <laughs> but it's gonna look cool when it's all done. <laughs> it'll, it'll be a good exercise for you too. I yeah. like the lighting effect in there. It's nice. Thank you. Yeah, by the time the last eyeball gets done, it'll be like such a good eyeball. <laughs> and then I'll have to do all the other ones again or something. Exactly. Exactly. That's <laughs> how it should be, right? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I mean that's that's one of the things is that you know, in some ways you almost have to reach a plateau before you embark on a large project. Yeah. So that you're not visibly evolving while you're working on it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I've, I've got a big thing I'll be working on when I'm done with all these still lives. <laughs> and it's, it's that thing that I built a model for last year. Oh, um, and part of me is, is almost wishing that, well, you know, I, I might actually bring the model in and set it up next to where I'm painting. So I'm still gonna, you know, lay it out the way I normally would using a projector and everything and having an optimized Photoshop completed, you know, reference. But I think it might be interesting if I were to also have the thing in the room mm -hmm. uh, while I'm painting and uh, try to refer to it more in real life than I do from the photo, just to see if I, uh, if I can gain something from all this still life experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally. So yeah, next Sunday we've got Nick Baxter. 
joining us for another session, and that's going to be a still life. Cool. Awesome. And he, of course, does these very meticulous, like long project kind of still lifes, but I think we'll be uh, doing some kind of a single night project. Of course, it's it's different when you have a photo reference, right? And I think the only way that we could all have the same still life scene is using photos, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, it's still something I think we can uh, kind of fake it, mm -hmm. pretend that we've got the real thing in front of us. It's just, uh, you know, you miss out on the chance to you can't move your head back and forth or look more closely at something and say, hmm, uh, how close are those together if I move my head a little bit? And then, you know, uh, that spacing is slightly better, you know, mm -hmm. um, end up making minor adjustments throughout the painting process that way. <clears throat> that, uh, you know, neighboring shapes might be too close to each other in a way that's hard to read, but if you shift your head just a little bit, they open up somewhat. Yeah, there's definitely a whole bunch of differences when you're just having it in front of you, for sure. I haven't done that for a long time, either. I haven't really ever done it. I remember when Michelle and I were first, you know, dating way back in the day. She tried to get me doing uh, a few still lives, and I was just like, ah, oh, that's boring. <laughs> but it's definitely a, a, a stretch <clears throat> doing a bunch of them like this. Yeah, good challenge. Holy moly. Oh, yeah. I'm going to be blown away by them. I love that one that um, Michelle did of the honeycomb and the butterfly I, I don't know if it was a oh, yeah. yeah that's what that was yeah was like that wow that must that must have been a bit of a, a longer one that was so much cool detail yeah i think she also with that one she was allowing herself to be looser than she has been with a lot with many of them mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course it looks great yeah, many of us still struggle to loosen up. No, for sure. I feel like I, I have such a hard time with that, for sure. I, I'll, like, start loose, and then, you know, you're still painting or drawing or whatever you're doing, and then you just keep going over it and over it, and then all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, this isn't loose at all anymore. Yeah. And that might just be tattooers' bad habits there. <laughs> I remember that was like a big thing, has been a big thing for me for probably as long as I've like drawn, which is pretty much since I was two. So I'm sure maybe when I was two, I was totally cool with it. But like, um, I remember when I was a teenager, it took me a long time to go get drawings into an actual nice sketchbook because I was just like it has to be perfect if it's going in this book mm -hmm. and I was right. like, yeah, yeah. like no it doesn't <laughs> have to justify the paper usage yeah exactly whereas when I was little my dad was working at a newspaper and so we had all of the leftovers clippings from when like you would usually do the actual copy and paste uh techniques and uh, and so we had like infinite paper. And so there was never any need to worry about that. So then I guess when it was like really nice paper, I got all weird about it. But I love looking at people's sketchbooks that have imperfect things and little half done things. And it's like so interesting to see. Yeah, you know, sometimes you're sketching something and you you've completed the thought yeah you know and when you look at that sketch you know exactly what you meant by it yeah. whatever is going to go farther into a painting or a tattoo or whatever you've got enough information there 
And yes. any more time spent on it would just simply be, I don't say wasted, but pointless. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you might lose some of that, the, the raw beauty behind that idea. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, I've also, with these, I've been trying not to um, bring the background color meticulously all the way up and wrap it around the edges and make everything perfect like that. Because if there's a part of me that is just inclined to do that. And I ask myself, am I being an artist when I do that? Or am I being like a frame shop employee? You know, I mean, what, what kind of sensibility am I even appealing to here? Uh, and so yeah I was I've, I've just been trying to escape this way of thinking and it's tough mm -hmm. there's a perfectionist side and of course a lot of it is what is your definition of perfection yeah and I'm trying to revisit that too and to me a definition of perfection would, would definitely include uh, you know, having enough of the, of the artist's fire, you know what I mean? Enough of their uh, natural movement of their <clears throat> intuitive uh, stabs at the, at the panel where mm -hmm. it's not all carefully blended out. It's not all uh, been given a second thought and a third chance and all that, you know, but instead a lot of it is just the first thing that that came out of that artist uh, in its raw form yeah mm -hmm. totally that's definitely something i struggle with yeah well and like with these okay uh i, I want it saturated enough or it just doesn't look finished <clears throat> even you know if it's loose it still has to be saturated enough and so in the course of saturating it of, of going over the entire surface enough to where there's not all those little white bristle marks where it's lifted the paint back up uh in the course of doing that it ends up being more blended and less uh yeah you know let's <clears throat> that intuitive thing, less of that uh, random uh, chance. You know? mm -hmm. So I then come back in and try to add it and it looks a little contrived. Mm -hmm. So I'm just not used to it, you know, new thing for me. I'm trying to be patient with myself. Totally, I think you'll get farther that way. I mean, just beating yourself up about any of it's just gonna make it like a less pleasurable experience. Oh, yeah. not get you any farther, so. I think a lot of people are just not patient enough with themselves. Totally. I agree. If art is painful for you, then you're not being patient enough with yourself. Yeah, exactly. I think a lot of people have, have expectations of, they feel not only do they want to do this well, as well as they can see in their mind's eye, well, you know, they can't think of any good reason why they can't. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and so when they don't succeed at it, at least as well as they'd like to, uh, it's easy to, to just feel defeatist. Mm -hmm. I like, I can't remember who was uh, saying it on the machine building um, panel, but... Uh, Somebody was saying uh, failure is the path to success, I think. Yeah. I was like, yeah, that's a great lesson for everybody doing anything. <laughs> it hurts, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you don't hurts. want that to be true. <laughs> if you can accept it to be true, then you might feel a little bit better. Well, I mean, at least... At least then when something doesn't work out, you can look at it and say, okay, 
what can I get out of this? Yeah. Yeah, there's always a, a learning, you know, that comes with all of that. Yeah. It's not all just damage. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> even when I have successful paintings, I can always, my eye always goes to the parts that weren't successful for me. You know? <laughs> no matter how much I try to ignore that. I, but that's okay, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm learning in that process. And totally. And feel, you're like, oh, I'm gonna do this next that. time. I feel more confident in that I can, the idea that I can have the eye to know what didn't work. Mm -hmm. Totally. This manticore has, yeah, and so if you, has been a nonstop. If you look at something that you did, yeah, if you look at something that you did and you see flaws in it, just be grateful that you're, you have the ability to see those flaws. Because exactly. if you didn't, if you didn't have those uh, that ability, you would never improve. Yeah. But it does hurt. <laughs> yeah, not comfortable. Yeah, it's One of my challenges with this one is that the reference itself is uh, very weathered, very old and weathered and pitted, mm -hmm. and uh, which is, you know, I think it looks cool. I'd like to be able to convey some of that. Like, can I make it look weathered and pitted and not just sloppy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> And a lot of that just comes with putting in enough hours. And uh, there might be shortcuts to it, but I haven't found them yet. <laughs> and sometimes there's just nothing you can do except look at it and say, it just needs more time. Yeah. I'm hoping that by the time we get through this whole series that I will feel that I've plateaued a little bit. And uh, I was hoping to identify a few things with this uh, series that, that I wanted to improve. You know, so I could set some short-term goals. And uh, actually, let me show you a couple. Uh, This one right here. This is this is the first one I did, and uh, and I like it. Oh, All right, no. it's, it's pretty good. Um, it's also one of the quickest ones, and if you look closely, <laughs> one of the loosest. And I've gone darker with my background since this one. I think mostly they've looked better, but the sense of luminosity, the sense of really seeing the light shine. I don't know. It's just not captured here. And I think if I were to go back and glaze over this, I could easily nail it, right? But I want to be able to get that with with one session. Do that, all the So that's one of one of my objectives. I also have kind of uh, really gotten comfortable working with panels instead of canvases. Uh -huh at least for these small sizes, because the ones that I've done on panels, I just think look better because we don't have uh, those little tiny pixels in the canvas. Yeah. And normally I like the little tiny pixels, but I think that below a certain size, maybe not so much. 
think that's one of the things that I discovered about myself with these is I don't like the canvas map on the, the really small paintings. I've been wanting to get back to painting on canvas. It's been a while since I've done that. Are you painting on wood right now, Leo? Yeah, it's a Genesis board. Oh, there you go. Wild. It's funny, my dad, um, he used to paint a lot and uh, he who would, would, didn't have very much money, so it would be on cardboard. And he still has some beautiful paintings. They're like probably maybe a little, but some of them are actually the same size as what you're doing. Um, and they're just a big piece of cardboard. <laughs> it's like this gorgeous painting. And then you like look at what it's on and you're like, wait a minute, it's like a box. <laughs> uh huh. Like corrugated cardboard? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, like a fridge box or something. <laughs> I recently discovered that one of my favorite bands, their first album cover, their their drummer does all their art. And, uh, you know, their first album cover was done on a scrap piece of cardboard that he had lying around <clears throat> at the shipping box. There you go. Nice. Too funny. Yeah, I just uh, got a couple of sheets of masonite and just chopped them up into a bunch of odd sizes. And uh, I think for doing something larger, I might still prefer canvas because those pixels, they allow you to sort of, uh, I don't know, they, they hide the, the flaws in your brushwork. Mm. And uh, when you're working with a surface that's this smooth, those flaws are just much more obvious, I think. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I've got a little bit of them. I'm gonna have to try them out. They're just a little bit bigger than the other stuff that I've got right now. So I haven't gotten myself up to that yet. Yeah, like Michelle has a couple of really large panels. And then, uh, well, I mean, you can see how much time that uh, that Leo ends up dumping into his, you know, yeah. gesso board. It's just the resolution of the detail is so fine. Yeah. That uh, there's really no, no upper limit at all to, to where you can take that uh, obsessive detail. <laughs> You know, when I when I first started uh, working on board or panel rather than canvas, one of the things that I found the most amazing about it was uh, just glazes. I felt were uh, for me a lot easier to work with because you didn't have your glaze kind of seeping into the the little pores of the canvas. Um, it just allowed me to manipulate it a bit easier without. Uh, without that canvas texture. I haven't tried glazes yet. Yeah, I think that uh, that would almost require a two part seminar, right? But maybe we'll need to do that at some point. It might be fun. And then the glazing. Yeah. Right now, I'm just trying to imagine what that would uh, consist of, right? But uh, mm -hmm. you know, we would have a project that we would lay out the first week. Maybe we would do two consecutive days. That could be fun too. And then just come back and, and add all the subtle lighting and atmosphere and everything else. It's amazing how it can change a, a piece. Oh yeah, absolutely.
And here's where I really run into that, <clears throat> that self-imposed limit because I'm working with such a big brush. I'm trying to render out these scales, <laughs> but I'm trying not to render out the scales. I think that's part of the whole point. I'm trying to put myself in a position where I can't really. The lighting's looking really cool on that, like very clear light source. It's starting to get directional. It's not quite there. But thank you. <laughs> yeah, the, the lighting on the actual sculpture isn't as strong as I would have liked to make it. But my whole setup that I've put together here is kind of uh, like set up around this more miniaturized, like the little gray paper setup that I've been using. And this guy's too big to fit on that. And so it doesn't fit within the jurisdiction of my lighting setup. And I just kind of, before I knew it, it was time to yeah. get on the Zoom call. And here we are. <laughs> But yeah, I feel like this is actually starting to take some shape and uh, I'm trying to figure out like where I'm going with it now, now that it does have some kind of uh, clarity to it. Like what I mean by where I'm going with it. Uh, what's what's the finished look mm -hmm. I want? Do I want to, you know, one, one of the things I would really like to have is a little bit more paint buildup, a little impasto and uh, I think that's the, another thing that I'm going to be doing with those. I'm, I'm going to do more of the wrinkled paper. Mm -hmm. pieces. And I love the idea of having some real thick buildup in the wrinkles of the paper. I think that, that would be a neat look. So, uh, you know, the other day, uh, we just placed an art supply order. And uh, Michelle ordered some modeling paste for building paint up a lot thicker. So, yeah, see how that goes. Oh, I see. It's like textures the paint. Yeah, yeah, it gives it gives it some body so that you can build it up without throwing away gigantic amounts of forty dollar oh, tube sure. paint. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> oh man. Another artist who has been doing still lifes lately is uh, actually another former tattoo artist, uh, David Heskin. And uh, yeah. he and his partner, Aloria uh, Weaver, have been reinventing themselves artistically this last couple of years and just trying to learn every like you know, classic lettering styles and stone carving and you name oh, it. Wow. And cool. then this, this month, David is pushing himself through a bunch of uh, still lifes. Hmm. Really neat. I did a painting trade with David years ago. Oh, nice. That's cool. Uh, yeah, I've got one of his pieces hanging up also as a result of a tattoo barter. Huh, nice. Uh, I love the tattoo barter thing. Mm -hmm. That is the best. It doesn't always work out for everything, but uh, when it does, it's always amazing. Agreed. I'll tell you from experience, you don't want to find an accountant. <laughs> your tattoo barter. not recommended. <laughs> Good to know.
I have one woman that's uh, bartering. She's got chickens that she ends up every <coughs> slaughtering. And so we uh, have little home home grown chickens as one of our barters for her tattoos. These things are good. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And she's over. It's funny because the people are always like, are you sure like this works out? I'm like, this is even better than money. Now I don't have to worry about getting chickens or getting whatever it is that I'm bartering. It's great. Like you have to have a certain amount to take care of other stuff, but like, I, I love it. And it makes it so that some people can actually get tattoos when they might not have been able to physically afford it with money. True, yeah. It's been an interesting thing uh, at the end of every night of doing these still lifes, looking at all the still lifes that other people are posting. And there's well over a hundred artists that are uh, involved in the challenge. It'd be interesting if, you know, see more tattooers doing challenges like this, but of course it's hard, right? When you're actually like, you know, tattooing all day long. <laughs> but yeah, you got that small percentage that's being done by people who clearly do it all the time. Yeah. And then you've got a whole bunch of pretty interesting stuff that that you can actually if if you look at the same names across multiple uh, weeks, you can see you can see that progression. That's so cool. I hope I'm able to see progression in my own by the end of this, because it's an unreasonable amount of work. <laughs> For yeah. someone who already has enough work that <laughs> it's already going on. How much are you able to take on this? Yeah, I don't know actually how. Yeah, it seemed it seemed like no big deal. Michelle suggested it when I sat down and did the first one. I thought, huh, only took ninety minutes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's just not how things go, especially if you're like me. You can have a tendency to make things a little bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, last night I did this, so surely <laughs> I have to make it at least 10% harder tonight. <laughs> yeah, I remember in school, I would almost never finish projects on time just because I would get them too complicated. I would, oh, I've got to do this and this and like, whoa, what? <laughs> like, why did you have to do that? Now you can't finish it at all. Yeah, and I think that for anybody who's going into, you know, an art profession as uh, as their future, going to have to learn to navigate that, right? Yep. There's there's the idealized version that <laughs> you know in your heart of hearts that you could do if all conditions were just right. <laughs> yeah. But then there's reality. Yeah. Exactly.
Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely be curious to see what uh, what Nick's uh, approach to still life would be uh, for something a la prima like this. Mm-hmm. Because he is such a renderer usually. Yeah. But when he did the uh, the landscape, he was very economical about it. I was impressed. Where he busted that out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No messing around. That was crazy. I did not realize how hard that was going to be. It was little, there was just so much reason for that. It was way more hard than I, than I had anticipated. Oh, yeah, it's like a little beach scene. And then you're like, oh, my God, what's with these little rocks and puddles? How am I supposed to do that? <laughs> Well, you find ways of just suggesting them, right? And <laughs> yeah. That's the trick. That is the trick. And, uh, you know, like, like that Rosetta painting we were looking at earlier, you know, it looks like there's so much action going on uh, and that each of the figures that he's battling is a fully fleshed out figure. But in fact, uh, there's a lot of kind of murky chaos with these figures kind of resolving out of it. Just enough shown of each one. Yeah. that you get the sense of the whole character and cool. uh so the more that we can do that the better yeah he, he suggests that more than he would do like you're creating this illusion that convinces people that's what's going on yeah i mean just like when you're painting a tree you don't have to paint every single leaf, right? You know, you might just paint a few clusters of leaves, you know, uh, spaced sort of organically around. And then the leaves that are farther back are going to be less rendered and just suggested. Or I'm sure you remember when you were a little kid, when you drew a brick wall, you know, you draw a couple of <laughs> loose clusters of hair in there, but you wouldn't draw every darn brick. It wouldn't make it a better, you know, drawing to draw every brick. Totally. And now I've reached that point where I'm exaggerating the lighting. And I hate to exaggerate compared to, you know, I'm looking at a real life object. I just feel like I need to with this one or else it's going to be flat. So, you know, you just want to make sure you're looking at what's really there and whatever exaggeration that you're doing, that it has some relationship with reality. Who here is familiar with Travis Louie? Yeah. yeah. He does a lot of those sort of crazy miniature portrait characters. But yeah, he's he's the interview subject for actually he's got moved Thursday to Wednesday. It's gonna be Wednesday this coming week. But I think what we're gonna be talking about, and not just interviewing him about his art, we're going to uh talk art history and he's going to show up some of his favorite artists through uh you know art history and um talk about their significance and, and that kind of thing um and it's always uh, i love hearing this coming from artists because they've got you know concrete reasons why they think somebody's significant and they can tell you why mm-hmm. so yeah i'm looking forward to that conversation mm-hmm. that's this wednesday Yes. And I think that is at two o'clock Eastern. Yeah. We're gonna try to do more more of those, these kind of art history talks, just Mm -hmm. in general. Uh, I think that a lot of tattooers 
I mean, they come into art through tattooing, right? So you can't be shocked that they don't know much about art history. But uh, I think it would be nice to provide a little bit of, of uh, resources in that, in that sense, at least a, a few good talks with uh, established artists. And then when, when discussing each of these historic figures, showing some of their work. Yeah, in a few minutes, if you want, we could uh, spotlight everybody's pieces again. I'd like to get another look and uh, see where we're all at. We've probably been at it for a couple hours now. Yeah, we got two and a half hours in. That's crazy, actually, to imagine how little I've gotten, but I'm really happy about what I've gotten. So that's all good. <laughs> yeah. Were you hoping to get farther or I mean that's yeah, I was like imagining somehow that I could finish this. <laughs> I have no idea why, because all of the little eyeballs are so detailed, but I'm really liking the effect. So um I'll be happy with wherever I get tonight. Well, so then you ask yourself, is there a more efficient way of doing those where some of them are less rendered or just suggested and a few key ones have that uh you know that the full treatment. Mm -hmm. Does it really become a better piece if they every single one of them gets the full treatment? Yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely like continuously learning an enormous amount about how to approach my next things that I start every time I do one. Cause I, it's just like it's just like that idea of like getting really uh, ambitious with what I imagine that you can do. Like I remember when I was, I don't know, six or seven, and I was we were doing something in school where you had to tear up little bits of construction paper and uh, of different colors and then create an image. And people are just making like a sun or you know a flower. And I made this panther with a rat. That had that was in its mouth and you could see its spinal cord because it had been ripped apart and I couldn't finish that in the amount of time that we were given but for some reason I was like yeah this is totally a reasonable project to start with ripped up pieces of paper right now like I haven't changed since I was six <laughs> well you know what's happening there is you're just seeing what's the most I could possibly do with this yeah <laughs> And then once you envision something that you're really inspired by, it's sometimes hard to scale it back and say, okay, well, that would be the awesome version, but what I'll actually be able to do is this. Totally. That's you know, it's, it's great to at least start by letting your imagination uh, carry it as far as you could, could imagine it. And then from there, figure out what's actually doable. Totally. Once you understand like your, um, different uh, su supplies that you're using like oh okay that that actually doesn't work for this or oh these actually really work well for this I could I could do more of that the next time yeah, I think by the time I'm done with this month's uh, round I'll have a method for working on panel better because it's still I mean, I love the look. Maybe I need to explore some different brushes. You know, and that's the thing. I could do a whole month of paintings just to try different brushes. Mm -hmm. you know, and each brush, I'd have to give it a, a few days, three, four days, you know, to give it a fair shot where you could really say, ah, this is not what I'm looking for. Totally.
there's so many variables. Yeah, it's like you'd have to just change the brush. You have to use then the same sort of canvas for a long time. Fully yeah, exactly. Get all you can't that. really know the difference until you've you've tried it in a controlled setting like that, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, let's go ahead and uh, and uh, spotlight each piece here real quick. All right. Yeah, this is really awesome. Okay, and so this is like uh, when I was talking about James Gurney. You know, he showed this example where it was a moonlit scene, but in it there was this little group of people sitting around a fire, so that you had something to, you know, work opposite the cool moonlit color. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that works great. Yeah, I've got you spotlighted. Oh, today. of course. Cool. Yeah, it looks awesome, bro. Thank you. I agree. Actually. Yeah, I think uh, might maybe even uh, spend even more time on this and just make this like a month long project or something. Awesome. You dial it in. Mm hmm. <clears throat> Melissa, I'm going to spotlight you here. I'm loving the rainbow yeah. situation. Nice. That's awesome. Just having fun. I'm taking that. That very <laughs> meticulous and structured approach to it. But uh, yeah. Do you recall the piece that, uh, that Rain did uh, a month or so ago? It was a little oval. And there was a sunset gradient. This reminds me of her piece just a little bit, except uh, Thank you. Thank you. Like your piece. Totally. Yeah, I love that. I love that it looks like super fantastical, but also like, yeah, technically that could happen, which would be pretty right. spectacular to see. Thank you. I haven't. Might as well use it for a good cause. Have oh, that yeah. I have an easier time layering with acrylics um, than I do oils. Is there any tips for like when I'm switching to oils to layer? Mm. Well, time. The, the thing <laughs> that, that works for me mostly is just working with uh, with glazes, and uh, you know that's just using a lot of uh, your medium and not very much paint. And that gives a lot of control over each layer of paint that you put down. So, you know, if you're trying to create an atmospheric <laughs> effect, you're trying to create just a little bit of mist or a little bit of lens flare or, or that kind of thing, or just taking it 10% or 5% darker or lighter or 5% cooler or warmer. If you're working really transparent, it's very easy to do that. And sometimes the way to do it is to just actually brush the medium over the area. Let's say you wanted to change the water yeah. and uh, make it just a little bit warmer. If you were to paint medium over the, the whole uh, water area, uh, just clear medium, and then just take the tiniest amount of paint in your brush, you'll find that you know that medium soaked area is very receptive, just grabs the paint right off of your brush and uh, that it blends super easily and intuitively. Uh, hmm. I love glazing. So yeah, I, you know we'll, we'll have to do that sometime. Sometime uh, this spring, I think we're going to have a, you know, a two sessions in one week kind of project where we do some glazing. I haven't actually led a painting thing yet. You know, we've we've had a lot of guest instructors, and I feel like uh, I've kind of you know learned a, enough new stuff. I'm ready to lead another paint workshop at some point. So uh, yeah, we'll do that and we'll focus on glazing because I think that would be really useful. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Um, Connor, I've got you up now. Yeah, it's still kind of hard to see with the poor resolution, so I apologize for that. No worries. So it's not the resolution so much as the lighting. Are you actually working and lighting that dim? 
it's not nearly as dim seeming as it is in the <laughs> video, but in all fairness, yeah, my basement isn't great. <laughs> well, I don't want to sound like your mother. <laughs> so I, I won't say the obvious. <laughs> yeah, I think I might have to migrate a lamp or two down here. <laughs> if your camera is struggling to resolve it, think about your poor eyes. Yeah, I've been putting them to the ringer. <laughs> But slowly getting there, it's just, I guess, the size of the piece, you know, makes it tough. This is easily the biggest thing I've ever, you know, played with, so. How many hours so far, you think? Uh, somewhere between probably 20 and 25. Yeah. Just, I keep yeah, so, it up for And so that's, that is the thing that sometimes causes uh, artists who aren't habitual about painting yet to get burned out. You know, you, you take on something that ends up you think, oh, this shouldn't take too long. It's just paint. You know, I can block it in in one day. But remember, we're tattooers. Right. So when you've got a canvas that size, that's like two back pieces. Yeah. <laughs> this Very is like, easy to get lost. Yeah. I just keep setting it places where it has to stare at me and then you know, <laughs> get back into it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good. I think it is important to sit back and look at it and... Uh, you know, I'll often take uh, breaks during the session to, you know, I'll make a fresh pot of tea or whatever and, and just re just stare at the thing. Because right. You're right up on it. You're not looking at it, honestly. Also, like turning it on its side or upside down or looking at it in the mirror. Oh. Hmm. Uh, yeah. you, mirror. It gives your eye a fresh way to look at it and you'll notice things that you didn't notice it by you know, you've been staring at it for so long, for so many hours, your eye kind of tends to, uh, it doesn't pick up on things that you might see in a mirror. That right. Okay. Right, things stop being obvious. Mm -hmm. You know, we stop being intuitive about it because we've just been staring at it. That totally makes sense. Yep. I'll yeah. even get into like uh, an area of the house that has a lower light <clears throat> So I'm not seeing it in good light and uh, it helps make little things more noticeable. Um, right. You know. I've got you spotlighted now, Leo. All right. I'll move this because I've got streams layer on there. Still working on it. Wow. You got really far in that last little bit though. That's yeah. Awesome. Very I'm really, I'm really just laying down a, a base coat that I plan on, you know, noodling over later. So it's, it's in a, this part is in what I call the ugly stage still. <laughs> uh, that's beautiful. I love the uh, shape of the, of the tail point, the scorpion tail. Thanks. Yeah, it's just a cool shape in, in general, the way that it sweeps yeah. across the top of the composition starkly yeah. against the sky. That's why I was glad that our, our shows did not do the uh, wings on it because uh, mm -hmm. the wings were going to cover up so much of the tail and the, you know, this back end that I wanted to show the scorpion body kind of melding into the rest of the, the creature. Yeah. And the wing would have hit all of that. So. Yeah. Well, that's why it's good that you did your research and, you know, you weren't stuck with that, that one interpretation of it. Yeah, and, you know, I almost, I almost just went with the wing anyway, because I was really excited to paint a big bird wing. But, yeah. was, you know, it was, it was the right decision, I think. That's the, the trouble when there's something that's just got so many cool aspects, like, oh, he's got wings and a baboon face. And also like this cool tail and like, you're like, what do I want from this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hard to narrow it down. Um, so then I'll go on to mine here. And so I got a lot more of the eyes done in there. Oh yeah. Um, it's really unclear on here, I'm realizing as well. 
got pretty good lighting, but there's a whole bunch of like shiny bits that are happening that you can't see at all. <laughs> You'll be able to see them when I put up a picture, but pretty happy with how that's going. Very nice. Right. So guys, I think I am gonna hit it. <clears throat> it's been great hanging with you all. Yeah, yeah. Thing on yeah. welcome to keep going as long as you want. Uh, Leo, thank you for leading us. It's been really great having you as a, as our host. Oh, and uh, you. Right. I really enjoy your, your knowledge of the subject and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you at something else here soon. And uh, everyone else, I will see you tomorrow evening. Ooh, see you then. then. All right. Cheers. Thank you. All right. How's everybody else feeling? I'm feeling like it probably is a good time to to put everything away. Is everybody else uh, wanting to go on? Because I can also uh, leave this going for a while still and uh, and just peek back on you in a little bit. I think I got to get some food and head to bed. But yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm going to probably it stop been, in a moment. I've been, <laughs> been awesome painting with y'all. Leo, thank you for letting us watch the paint. Yes, thank you for tuning in, man. Sure. Hell yeah. I've uh, been nursing a headache all day long, so I think I'm probably going to find a stopping point here myself. That's fair. Yeah. If I need some help. Some rest. Concentrating on all that details, probably. <laughs> 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 awesome. Um, so before we sign off, I'm just going to remind everybody that tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Eastern, uh, the drawing group with Jake Meeks is happening. Um, at noon tomorrow, uh, Mark from Needle Jig is going to be let's, doing Let's Talk Tattoo. And then we're going to be doing Depth Strategies Part 2 Contour for those of you that are in the reinventing group. So, see you all.